Good morning, ladies. I will be reading 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 18. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. I'm sorry, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are also being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and pre present us with him, excuse me, and present us with you to himself. Although, I apologize, all this is for our benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow, flow, to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. If you prepare your mind for prayer, um, Sister Jerry Allen. Good morning. Please let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, we come to you today to honor you, to praise you, and to thank you. We thank you, dear Lord, for your love, for your mercy, and your grace. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for blessing us each and every day. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we would like to take this time to thank you for our speaker, Crystal Bowers Guy. Dear Heavenly Father, bless her and be with her today as she speak to us and bring us a message that you have placed upon her heart, dear God. Dear Heavenly Father, please open our, our, our ears and our minds and our hearts so that we may be able to receive the message and apply it to our lives. Dear Lord, please forgive us of our sins. Heavenly Father, and please, Lord, let this symposium be pleasing and acceptable to you, dear God. And let it also be a blessing to everyone that is present here today. This we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Good morning, ladies. Well, I am here to introduce the speaker, but I don't have to do that. You all were here yesterday, right? She needs no introduction. We know she's a daughter of Figueroa. We know that's my sister in Christ. We know that yesterday she did an amazing job, and we know you all are looking forward to hearing her again. So it's Crystal Bowers Guy who will be coming forward, but just before she does, we have an addition to the program that Crystal doesn't really know about, but we're gonna bring that addition up right now. Surprise. 
for those of you who don't know, this is the uh, girls' glee. Uh, a few of the girls' glee. That didn't sound like a good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can we say, I was, when they I was glad when they said unto me. Come on now. I was glad when they said unto me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. So we are here. Wherever we are as a church, that's where God is, right? So two or more are gathered, and so he's in the midst, and so let's act like he's in the midst today. Um, I had a wonderful time yesterday. Again, I want to thank Charlotte and Kathleen for inviting me to come, and I didn't think I was going to get to see my sisters, my older sisters, <laughs> but... Um, it's good to see them. And we've shared so many things in life together growing up. I was probably one of the last of the girls lead to be added, but uh, they mean a lot to me and we do keep in touch. Um, all of us have either lost a parent or both parents. Um, we've lost group members, but nevertheless, and we've all experienced some kind of health conditions, but we've stuck together had some good times traveling, and I love them. So thank you guys for coming. Okay, 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, iPad, 
iPhone, Kindle, whatever you uh, choose to use. I like to use the word. I just like flipping through the pages. <laughs> but I left my Bible again. And um, oops. So we're talking about life through the eyes of the cross. I wanted this to be kind of um, interactive today. So if you have a comment on anything that I'm saying, please raise your hand or stand up so we can kind of interact. This is Sunday school, and I'll try to get right to the three points that I did not get to yesterday. But we are talking about from, uh, from the book, of 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, you can, or I don't know if it will be up on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 4, am I too close? Oh, okay. Thank you. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18. I like this verse in the very beginning. Um, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. And if you know anything about Paul, he was at one time called Saul. What did he do? He persecuted the church. He actually was involved in the killing of many Christians. And so to hear him write on this side of his life is very inspiring and can be inspiring to us as women because we were not always in the church. Some of us came from difficult lives or what have you, but I like what he says in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of what? Clay, that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not, we're not what? We're not perplexed but not driven to despair. So things happen to us on a daily basis. And we talk about when God is a good God and that will never change. He's telling you right here that we're going to have difficult times. Expect it. That's just the way life is because we're not, we're not going to be here forever. We're flesh and blood. But more importantly, we have a spirit that hopefully one day we will take on a new light and be with Christ. So because we have all of this, we are not to despair. We're persecuted, right? But not what? So he's telling you again that we may be talked about on our jobs, we may have relationships problems, but I'm telling you as we go down further in the passage, we were not as persecuted, we're not as persecuted as badly as those first century Christians were. We have an opportunity to come into an edifice or a building to come together to study the word of God. Whereas women, they couldn't do that back then. It had to be secret. That was forbidden. And there were women, we talk about it in the Bible, we see a lot of men who were persecuted, but women too were persecuted because they believed in God. So we should be very grateful that we have the privilege, the blessing, and an opportunity to be together, to worship God in spirit and in truth, to fellowship one with another, and to study the word of God. So I don't want anybody to go to sleep. So we're not, we're, we're not forsaken, we're not struck down, but not, but not what? Destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And then further down he goes to verse 16. And this is his admonition to us. This is my inspiration to you. So we do not lose heart. It's very easy for us to get discouraged very easy for us to want to give up when we come into diverse situations in life, whether it's a personal illness, whether whatever it is. We talked about a lot of those challenges that women face, and there are a lot, but we're strong. I've learned the things that I've gone through have made me a better person. 
And I'm only a better person by the grace of God. Nothing that I did is what he did in me. So he says, don't lose heart. Though our, what, outer selves is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, light. So he was balancing affliction against the things that are unseen. The things that are unseen are eternal. So to him, the things that we go through are light compared to what we're going to receive on the other side if we are faithful. We're not perfect women. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm not even telling you to be perfect. I'm saying that if we are faithful to God through our afflictions, we will, what we see as unseen, experience eternal life. That is for those who are gone on. That's why after a while, and I can say this, after a while, you know, you still cry when you lose those you love, but when you really think about it, would they want to come back? I'm like, no. I wouldn't want to come back because they're resting. And they're waiting their call to be, you know, to enter into heaven. Why would they want to come back? So my crying is not so much because, oh, I'm just grieving. You have to go through grief. But at the same time, if those who we love have died in the Lord, they are going to receive eternal life. And so that puts it in perspective that we're not here to stay. This ain't home. We're passing through. Okay, so in verse 7, Paul, he talks about we have a treasure in earth and vessels. The gospel is compared to a treasure. And they are placed in clay jars or clay pots, which are the Christians. We are the clay pots. And so we often lose sight of the role that women play in carrying out the message, the gospel, now, I'm not talking about standing where, like, when we got picked up our car, we had some people standing in, do you believe in God, you know, or you have the Jehovah Witnesses coming by. Not so much that. But there are women now who carry out the gospel in many different ways. And many times it is through your actions, your attitude. What do they say? Your attitude determines your altitude. If you are looking low, walking with the turkeys, guess what? You're going to act like one. But if you're soaring with the eagles, acting like the eagles, overlooking beauty and overlooking the world, then you're going to have the attitude of an eagle. So let's review some women very quickly who played significant roles in the kingdom of God. And I know so many women here, I can look out and I can point to you, women who have used their talents in ministry. I'm not talking about getting a pulpit and preaching, although I told Vincent, I can preach Sunday morning this morning if y'all want me to. <laughs> That's just a joke. But I can look out here, I see Sister Pitts, I see Sylvia Ward, I see Christine Bush, Charlotte, Sister Murray, Annie Swan, Leveretta, Carol, Mama Jones, Angie, Mama Boone. I see so many women and I don't want to just start calling names because I'll forget someone, but even Bonnie Major left her home and went to the Bahamas. Yes, she comes back every now and then, but that's where her ministry is. But so many of you have different talents and God has put this in this clay jar, okay? So look in Exodus 1, you can just write these down because I do really encourage you to go back and read about these women. Forgive me because I'm not a scholar of the Bible and I can't really tell you what their names were, but Sapura and Pua, they were women who at the time in Exodus, uh, when the king wanted to kill all the boy, the males, these women were hiding the children. Now, what would have happened if she hadn't hid the children? 
we wouldn't have Jesus Christ because they were part of the Christian, the Jewish, the, the tribe of Judah, okay? So let's go to Rahab, write down Rahab, Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 24. What do we know about Rahab? What was her profession? She was a lady of the evening. Some people call her a tool that you use in the garden. You know, some people call her a prostitute, what have you. But God used her. She had heard about Joshua. But guess what? She took them in and they taught her. Her whole family was saved because of her action and because of what she heard about God. She was used. She was a woman in the ministry. What about the women at the tomb? You can write that down. Luke chapter 24 verses 1 through 11. Who were the first women, who were the first people at the tomb when Jesus rose? Who? Women. And then they went back and told the apostles, like, what's wrong with y'all? He's, he's risen. I'm going to tell you one thing about women, and I know this for a fact. I remember when uh, we did a documentary on the 60th anniversary, I think it was, and uh, Charles Klein, Uncle Charlie, was talking about when they built this building and how many women were responsible for the beams that we see up here financially. Women were very instrumental in churches back in the day. They would read scriptures because some of the men couldn't read. They were instrumental in singing songs because some of the men didn't have, couldn't carry a tune. But women have always been very supportive of men's ministry and they have their own ministry too. So don't count it out. Everything that God put in your jar that is of clay, he put it there for a good reason. And if we don't use it, we lose it. So don't minimize your gift. If it's cooking, if it's baking, if it's sewing, if it's sending a card, nobody needs to know what you're doing but you. You're not here to receive the accolades of men. You're here to receive the, the uh, yeah. You know, you're, re you're here to receive the goodness of God and his approval. And his you do it for his glory, nothing else. Okay, and then on into, this is still in the New Testament, Lydia. What do we know about Lydia? Acts chapter 16, verses 4. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Lydia was a businesswoman, and we got a lot of businesswomen in here. So when we're talking about looking through the eyes of the cross, these women were looking through the eyes of the cross because they used what they had to further the gospel. What are you doing to further the gospel? Are you just taking up oxygen every day? Or are you just coming to worship on Sunday and sitting on the pew and keeping it warm and telling the person that's sitting next to you, that's my seat? I'll say it again. Are you coming to worship? Does that seat have your name on it with a plate that has been, you know, put in that seat? And you tell the person that's there, I'm, baby, I'm sorry, you got to move over. But Lydia was a businesswoman. We know her as the woman of what? Purple cloth. But do you know that she was the first convert in Europe? She was a part of the first beginning of the church in Philippi. So when you go over to the book of Philippians and Paul says, I thank you for remembering me. You know who he's talking about? Some of them women over that he converted in the beginning. So we have to put everything in perspective how powerful women are in the ministry. We can't minimize that. And when you look through the eyes of the cross, you should feel empowered. Not so much that I'm here to inspire you, but I'm here to remind you the power that God gave you when you said yes. 
He gave you the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit should be able to guide you through anything. When you ask, you receive. You don't have because you don't ask. So Lydia was very involved in Paul's ministry, one of his biggest supporters. Then we go on to Priscilla and Aquila. What do we know about Priscilla and Aquila? They were what? They were team teachers. But the thing that I like about the story, and that's in Acts chapter 18, verse 24 and 26. They loved to share the gospel and Apollos was up preaching. They didn't do what some of us do. Some older women do this. Baby, that was a good sermon, but you know, when you got to that point right there, I need to correct you on that. And we do that sometimes. But what they did, they took Apollos aside and they spoke to him in love. And really, I think this whole weekend when we talk about enduring and God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, all we're talking about is love. The love that he has for us and what he wants from us is the reconciliation of a relationship to him. He gave us a free will to do whatever we wanted to do. However, he wants to let us know how much he loves us so much that he came off the cross, uh, came off the throne himself to experience life through his son and then to hang him on a cross. And some of us use a cross so lightly. We have them hung up around our homes. I like crosses of different kind. We wear them around our necks, but we don't know the significance, the meaning of the cross. So our words and our approach, like Priscilla and Aquila, are very important. We have to learn not to shut people down. I remember my father saying this one Sunday, get, you know, you come go to work or somebody say, good morning, say, what's so good about it? Or you say, good morning, you're going to hell. You know, we're quick to put people where we think they should be instead of coming to where they are. The Bible says, be in the world, but not of the world. We're in it because we're here. But how do we act when we're in it? Are we displaying the true Christian qualities that Jesus displayed? Do we take the mind on of Christ when a car cuts us off or do we say the first thing that comes to our minds? Okay? And then the same with, when we're talking about looking through the eyes of the cross, I think about young people and what we say to them. If they have on a short skirt or something that's inappropriate, we rather talk about them then take them aside and say, baby, you know that you need to put a cloth over your legs or you need to wear some stockings or whatever. It's so important. The older women are to teach what? The younger women. And some of the older women sure enough need to teach me how to cook. <laughs> you know, we need, the older women back in the day, that's what they did. These women, Sister Fillmore, they sold. We, and the greatest ministry that I can think, one of the greatest ministries I can think about uh, is, are two, the women at work and then lace. Those are ministries. I could name many women who have gotten together, put these national dinner days together, but, you know, forget all of that. Why were they doing it? They were doing it because they were trying to preserve Christian education. We need that more than we need anything. But not so much more than that. As I talk about, you know, speaking to children, uh, we want to just go on down and says, we want to go to the, per the persecuted but not forsaken. And I want to talk about how uh, the Christians were persecuted in the New Testament. And there, there's external evidence that I found that there were martyrs back in the day. And I, I'm not going to read all of them, but these women were stripped. They were hung. They were put to uh, post and burned. We have some that were skinned. Um, 
because they believed in God. We hear about it in the Bible, but we don't, you know, we don't ever read about the women other than that in other books. So it's very important for us to remember what God has put into us. And we're persecuted on many levels. Can anybody name some things or some areas that we're persecuted in today versus like with the Bible? In the Bible, what those characters were persecuted and how? Does anybody have any idea? How are we persecuted today as women? Crickets. Somebody got to know which some, what are some ways? Kathleen. I just start calling a folk. Have you, has anybody ever been paid less and you're doing just as much as the man is doing? I don't understand that. And even sometimes how we are treated as women on the workplace, sexual harassment. You know, men feel like they can say anything to you, about you, put you in your place, you do your job. That's another way of persecution. Give me something else, Charlotte, you got something? Literally. <laughs> uh, Charlotte's basically saying how men look at us in the church, in our own home. We're looked at to be submissive, and they take it the wrong way. We have, so there's some women in here that are financially wizards, better than some of the men in the counting room. I used to call it the casino. But we have gifts that God has given us, and sometimes they are stifled by the persecution that we feel from each other. We stifle each other. And so that's another one. Anybody else have another one? Yes, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. So in the church, when we have something that we want to say or share, we should be silent. You know, truly, we need to read the scriptures for what they are and study what they mean. Because they don't always mean literally what is written in the page. Women are to be silent. You know, and, and then now we have this, this new movement of women who are taking roles in the church getting up actually preaching, waiting on the table and all these things. But that's, well, that's not so much persecution. I'm just giving you an example of some things that they do in the church. But there's persecution within the body of Christ against each other. So we have to constantly check where we are in life according to what the Bible says. We're not to shut people out when we do share the gospel. We ought to be team players when we are sharing the gospel. If you do have a talent, you don't need to express it to everyone. Just do it for the glory of God. You don't work for man, but you do work for God. Uh, let's see. There have been a lot of women who've made sacrifices, you know, for us. Our parents made sacrifices for us. And I think this is one thing that may um, strike home a lot more. Uh, there are a lot of single moms, uh, and not even so much single mothers, but families, period, where we depend on the church to raise our children. And that's not really where the teaching begins. The teaching begins where? 
in the home. A good example of that is in 1 Timothy. You can turn over there whenever. But who are we talking about in 1 Timothy? Lois and Eunice, a mother and a grandmother, teaching not a girl, but a boy. And he became very uh, famous to the writings of the gospel. Not because of a father figure, we all need father figures, but he had a mother and a grandmother. If your children don't see you, I don't care if you're a grandparent, great-grandparent, whatever. I'm sure some of you that are grandmothers are taking care of your grandchildren and great-grands. So, and if you are a mother yourself, if you're not convicted by the word of God, how are you going to display what the child should do? When you send them to school, I had a mother say, don't call me when he acting up at school, that's your job. Oh, okay, you need to come get him now. But the important thing is, is that it starts in the home. Most of the stories that you hear of the apostles or going into the home and teaching or going to teach, they went into people's homes. They were hospitable. But every lesson for our kids start in the home. And, you know, Taylor is a teenager by every sense of the word. And I think, I, I, I tell her I'm not a perfect mom. But what I do want you to understand is, at the end of the day, it does not matter what goes on. You have to have your own personal faith. You have to trust in God when there is nobody else you can hang on to. Because mommy's not going to be here forever. Your father's not going to be here forever. People leave. But you have to develop a deep sense of what God's relationship is to you. Because there will be times when you're out there in that world and you're going to have to pull on what your parents taught you. And I know I do, and I did it, I do it more so now than I ever did. Because everything that they said would happen has come to light. And back then I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Got us at church every Sunday, well, Sunday night, Wednesday, Wednesday. I mean, what? But there's something important about placing the seeds in the minds of children. It's kind of like Shirley Weber said, Dr. Weber said yesterday, that women who read, their children become, you know, they're readers too. They're smart. When you carrying a child, whatever negative emotions and things that you have going on, you feed it to the children. So women have a very, very important role when looking through the eyes of the cross. Um, how much more time do I have? <laughs> Ooh, 15 minutes. Well, this is what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to hear from you all some experiences that you've had. Most of you have been in the church for more than 10, how many have been in here 10 years? Raise your hand. Hi. How many have been in more than 20? Keep them up. 30, 40. You know, so we ought to know, right? You've experienced some things that you can teach the person next to you. So is there anyone willing to share a testimony very quickly about how they have had to see the cross, how they have had to look through the eyes of the cross and how God has put in their vessel, in their clay jar, but they've experienced affliction. Are you gonna be the first one, Sherilyn? Oh, don't, why don't you be the first one? I know, no? She doesn't want to. Okay, I saw a hand over here, right here. Try to make them brief, but the only way we can learn, not just through the Bible, is if we share. And when I say share, I don't mean share and then go tell somebody, girl, did you know so-and-so did so-and-so? 
That's, that's, not, that, that's really none of your business. We don't share to talk about people. We share to encourage and edify each other. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Arlena, and I've been in the body of Christ since 1979. But, um, Speak up a little louder. Okay. Uh, I've been in the body of Christ for, uh, since 1979, but after like uh, about 10, 11 years, I had fell away from the body. And I, I went back out in the world and I experienced some things that I had never experienced before. And uh, the more I stayed out there, the worse life got for me. And things happened in my life where God had to save me. My life was almost taken. But God seen in me that I never saw what I never seen in myself. And the purpose that I am here today is because God had a plan for my life. And I couldn't find it in the world. But he brought me back here to give me another chance to do better by him. And that's how I know. That's when I learned to realize how to understand what um, being delivered is. Because God has delivered me from the desires and the things that I was desiring and wanted to do that wasn't in him. So he delivered me from the, all of those things so that he can really clean me up so that I can be an example to my children and to those that I come in contact with that's around me now. And that's what I'm striving for now to do better by God than I was doing for myself. Thank you, Arlene, for that testimony. So sometimes when we, we are in the church, sometimes we stray off and leave. But God is a God of a second chance. And if we know that and we come back to him and fully repent, then, then we can go on. He wipes the slate clean. He's not like some of us. We hold on to the grudges. God lets them go. Now, do we just continue in sin that what grace may abound? No. But we use those things that we have learned to come back and do better. Is there anyone else that wants to share a quick testimony? Veronica? Me, I've been through like so much. But like Sharon been there for me since my baby was born. And she the one that brought me to Christ, that brought me here. I've actually been here for six years already. The, since my son's father started coming, I've been like just falling off of track. But Sister Aline and Sister Sharon is the one that got me back to the church. Because they know I need people that surrounding me through the stuff that I've been through. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been without my family since I was a kid. I was raised in foster care. You know, like I told my family, you know, I've been through this to myself by myself since you guys watching around. I've been raised myself since I was 18 without my family. And like I told my mom, yeah, I know I love you, mom, but you had to go do what you had to do for yourself. And then, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm your daughter, but, you know, now I'm a mother with a six-year-old. I can't, like, 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 I told everybody in my family, I can't depend on you guys to still try to take care of me if I'm already 36, about to be 37. I've been doing this since I was 18. And I've been living on different places. I've been in and out of shelter all my life, but Sharon brought me to the church and got myself back, back on track. But do you see how God can protect you? He has never forgotten or forsaken either one of these testimonies. He didn't go anywhere. We may have stepped out, but he, you know, it's, it's so important for those of us who are strong in the faith to surround those who are outside, who are going through things. It's okay if you stand there and you just say, it's all right, I'm praying for you hold their hand or whatever it is. People, we have folk in the church that are hurting. 
There have been people that have been out in the world, been in the street, whatever the situation is, but you're no better than they are. So for God to put this, this verse in Hebrews, that we are jars, or that we are vessels, that we're not crushed or perplexed. God, it just continues to tell us that God has never forsaken us, nor will he leave us. You have to tell yourself that every day. And sometimes what I have done, I put post-it notes. I'm like being Mary Jane. <laughs> I got post-it notes everywhere to remind me. Because sometimes I don't just have my Bible right there. But I also talk to God all day long Prayer is not just when you get on your knees, prostrate before the Lord. It's in the car, having a conversation. He will hear you. Now, will it turn out the way you want, Veronica? I don't know. But you keep holding on to his hand and something good will come out of it. The same for you, Arlene. Now you have, some, you have a responsibility. If he protected you and saved you, now you got to go back and get somebody else. Anybody else want to give a last testimony before we quit? Right here. Veronica? Right here. Her hand. Okay. The Bible tells us to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. God has never sent any of us into the field to work without first preparing us. And those of us who have gone through trials and tribulations, through losses, through uh, whatever experiences come in life, God has prepared us in advance. So my thing is this, uh, instead of crying, calling a pity party, oh, poor me, just say, Father, help me to know the lesson that you want me to learn and help me to have the strength to go through whatever you're sending my way. Because God will test us and as he's preparing us. And he doesn't do it because there's nothing else to do. He does it because he wants us to uh, follow in his footsteps. Uh, we know that the Bible tells us, man that's born of a woman is of a few days and they're full of a good time. So when we become a Christians, we don't have to worry about any trouble. We know that everything is just going to be a good time. Well, news for you. That's when Satan gets busy. It's when you become a child of God. So don't keep looking for, oh, all of my troubles are over now. No, no. They're just beginning. You thank God that he has chosen you to be an example for a Christian, for him. And I think that this is where I gain my strength from, from the scriptures, which tell me that whatever God sends my way, he hasn't forsaken me, he will never leave me, he will never put more on me than I'm able to bear. And once you really believe what you're reading, it gives you strength and courage to do what God would have you to do. Thank you, my Sunday school teacher of I don't know how many years ago. <laughs> but, you know, that's true. Now, I will say this, saying it and believing it is two different things. We can quote the scripture, or we can say what's in the Bible, and that's true. That's where you do gain your strength from. But there are times when we are on the floor. There are times we have been in our personal closets and cried and yelled before the Lord that I need help. But you know what? There's something else I tell Taylor. Okay, you can wallow around on that floor if you want to, but after 10 minutes, you better get up. You still got to go to practice. Well, I don't feel good, Mom, or this is just not working out the way I want it. I said, who said it was going to work out the way you wanted it to? You just get up and do what has been asked of you, and then there will be a way made for you. But I do say, there are times when we cry. We'll use up a whole tissue box and everything else. But that's okay. But just know your joy will come in the morning. Tear, even Jesus cried. David yelled out to the Lord for help. There's nothing wrong with that. And we should not make others feel bad because they do. 
Some people can say, praise the Lord. I just walked around and praised my way through a situation. You might, but you might be crying while you're doing it. Nothing wrong with that. So I want to close today. If, if you feel that you're in a place right now, and I know we're going to go into contribution and all of that, but I'm a firm believer that prayer does work. Because there have been times when I didn't think as I was in a situation, I couldn't see my way out of it. I look back now and I wonder how I got over. And I know who it was. And I know what it was. It was nothing but God. When you watch and you see things happen in your personal life or you go out there on the street or whatever your situation is and then you are back in a place of love where people care about you you say well wow I did make it through if God brought it to you he can bring you through it and that might be a rote statement but it's true so I believe where two or more are gathered God is in the midst and when we pray God does hear us so if you feel like you're in a bad place right now, when I say bad, just away from the Lord. We're going to all stand up, but just take the hand of the person next to you. And we're going to pray for whatever your situation is. If you've lost someone, if you're going through a personal illness yourself and you're still here, God has a purpose for you. Don't give up. Don't give out. Do what you can today because tomorrow is not promised. If someone is put on your heart for you to call them, there's a reason why. Call them, you never know. So let's stand and let's sing a verse of a song. Let's see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. want to thank you Lord you've been my friend you've been my friend Lord you've been my friend you've been my friend just want to thank you, Lord. You saved my soul. 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 I just want to thank you, Lord. Let's pray. In everything, we give thanks to you, O oh Lord. We thank you for being with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us. There's someone in the audience today, my sisters, who may feel that you have forsaken them. I hope that just this real brief study, Lord, of your word shows them that we are those jars, those earthen vessels that you have put worth into, that you haven't forsaken us, that you haven't left us. But even when we leave you, Lord, you still seem to provide a way. Help us to look to you, Father, for those things that we cannot provide for ourselves. There are people who did not wake up this morning, and so we are thankful. We're thankful for the things that we do go through because they do make us a better person, better women. Help us to see the value in the valley that we may go to others and help someone else. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's about you. The world needs you. Help us as women in the church to be loving to each other that others will see the love that we have for each other 
and thereby they'll know that we're Christians. Help us to be that way on our jobs, with our children, wherever we are in life. I ask you to reach that sister today with whatever they stand in need of. Thank you for the cross that Jesus died on, that you gave him as your own son to save the world. Those that we would say are not worthy, but you died to save them. We thank you for his burial, but most of all, Father, his resurrection. We have hope that one day, if we live faithfully unto your word, that we will reside with you in heaven. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. So we want to be with you. Help us when we fall short, that we not be too hard on ourselves, Lord, but look to you for that forgiveness. Look to our sisters when we have taken aught with one another to make it correct, for our sacrifices will not be accepted if we don't make it right with each other. All of these things, Father, I ask, and I thank you so much for allowing me and Taylor to come home to feel the love of those that we have loved all these years. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name.